Welcome back to Media 3. Years of speculation over the future of TVNZ's Avalon complex was ended recently with the news that Avalon is to be sold to a new company, Avalon Holdings. We sent Jose Barbosa to the Hutt Valley to investigate. This is the TVNZ Avalon Studios, a purpose-built facility for making television. And when the final concrete slab was laid in the mid-70s, it was apparently just in the nick of time. Television in Wellington, the NZBC was scattered to the four winds. There was one major, very old studio. I mean, it was so old that the spare parts had been produced, I think, at the time of the Crimean War. And I remember on one occasion doing a live program. In the course of this program, as I discovered later, the control panel fell out onto the hands of the director and the vision mixer. And that wasn't the first time. I mean, that happened with reasonable regularity. You might not recognise any of these shows, but they were all made at Avalon, and altogether they've contributed to our collective culture. This is New Zealand becoming itself. In its heyday, this place was absolutely fizzing. Despite its starless demeanour, Avalon's become famous for its workplace hijinks. It was a healthy, noisy, self-contained, incestuous, uh, drunken, drug-crazed, well not drug-crazed, but drugs were not unknown. We have it on very good authority that after a particularly good party, an ex-member of the royal family threw a pot plant out of a seventh floor office window and then weed into an ashtray. I remember Helen Clark sitting uh, through a live performance of Dancing with the Stars and her cell phone went off um, <laughs> and she was very embarrassed. Um, she was incredibly supportive of the arts and we all love Helen, but she had to shout the crew a slab of beer. All that malarkey wasn't to last though. At the dawn of the 80s, Prime Minister Rob Muldoon fed up after years of hard questioning from insolent young TV reporters, symbolically washed his hair of the news department. He moved it and eventually the rest of the organisation to Auckland. It was easier to kind of roll over move the news 600 kilometres uh, further away from where stuff happened. So uh, news people and commentators and critics uh, were not so much in his face. Mr Muldoon, I'd like to begin by telling you that I regard this as the most difficult interview I've ever done. Not because it's you, but because of the pressures that I've been under over the last two weeks to spill your blood on the studio floor. Slowly, more and more production moved to Auckland. Now the place is pretty empty. Only a fraction of it is used as was intended, despite its advantages being pretty clear. Studio 8, which is the largest, uh, one of the largest studios in the Southern Hemisphere, that could accommodate a big, large studio live audience. Um, it could have up to eight cameras. Um, it was able to be switched and worked in the control room um, with a fully digital suite. And it certainly, in terms of sound and vision, was churning out some really, really lovely, lovely pictures. And the sound quality was just absolutely divine. In any case, it's now been sold. After a year of negotiation, it's officially been purchased by a consortium, which formally takes possession in March 2013. We've got a, a, a very small group together, uh, and it includes two of the existing senior personnel out there who have very small shareholdings, mainly uh, part of an employment package, really. It's ideally set up for things like international children's TV, uh, and we are, are having discussions with some producers who could be interested in, in that kind of operation. So we're hoping to really work upon our independent status as being tied to no particular director, no particular producer, uh, and being able to offer their studios for hire on a, on a normal business basis, more as a, pr a property investment rather than a production business. As you've heard, Avalon has many stories, but it also has many mysteries. One of the most compelling is the mystery of the brass plaque. This place was opened in 1975 and a brass plaque was laid to commemorate the affair. Now, details are sketchy and we can only go on limited sources, but sometime 25 years or so ago, the plaque disappeared completely and nobody's seen it since. The story is that after a heavy session at the TV1 bar, a group of young tearaways prized the plaque off its plinth. 
So do you know what's happened to the brass plaque? I've got no idea. No. I wasn't aware there was one. Unfortunately, if I told you, I would have to kill you. Well, after an exhaustive investigation involving dozens of man hours, we can finally reveal the fate of the brass plaque. We were sent these pictures by a party or parties who wish to remain anonymous. Here you can clearly see the stolen plaque hoisted in this man's flippers. There's a buffalo skull on the wall, which leads us to the conclusion the plaque is somewhere in the wilds of northern Australia. Perhaps one day Excalibur will return to Avalon, but in the meantime, a fight for survival is getting underway. It's not over till the fat lady sings, really, is it? Joe Barbosa with that report. And that's our show. Thanks to John Hardevelt, Jonathan Milne, Keith Ng and Ben Howe, and to you for watching. We'll be back with Media 3 at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.